obviously there's a lot of interest in this topic. It didn't take all that long for everybody to get back after break, so we don't want to, uh, we don't want to just slow up on this uh, discussion. I want to introduce our, our panelists. Uh, first of all, uh, on the right end, on the right side of the table here, uh, Michael Sullivan, who is the mayor of Fredonia. He's a sole practitioner in the Fredonia area. In the middle, uh, Jeffrey Jacobs, a uh, partner in the law firm of Coughlin and, and Gerhardt. Uh, he uh, also concentrates uh, his uh, matters around mergers and acquisitions, municipal zoning and land use law. And then on the, on the very end, uh, John Plum, the counsel to the law firm of Lundberg and Gustafson, uh, from counsel to the village of Randolph and town of Randolph. And I'll turn this back over to Mark Gargos, who's going to moderate. Well, if I've done my job right, I'm going to spectate and not moderate. Um, but we're really fortunate to have a very diverse panel, and uh, I'm going to actually ask each of them, probably starting with, uh, with Mike, uh, to just explain their perspective, how they've been involved perhaps in dissolution efforts so far, uh, what they might have seen that's worked, maybe what hasn't worked, and then we'll open this up to our, our fact scenario about municipal dissolution. Who gets the kids, and how do we pay for them? Mike? Well, I'm uh, the mayor of the village of Fredonia uh, and had the opportunity this past, uh, about a year and a half ago now, to go up and uh, actually introduce the Attorney General when he was in Buffalo giving his presentation on the new statute. Uh, I think I was selected because, quite frankly, there's nobody else in the mayor's conference they could find. And I know they had a hard time finding somebody because they reached out and found a conservative Republican to go up and spend some time with the, with the Attorney General. Uh, my observations of this law are that it puts it in the hands of the citizens, but it has left the void on giving some idea of a plan. I talked to people from Lakewood, I went and attended a couple of the meetings they had, anticipating what we could do in Fredonia. And the clear message I found was, it's great, there's a lot of people that would be interested in supporting it, but you have to give us some general idea of what's gonna happen. What types of services are we still gonna be able to expect from our town government? What will our town be able to assume, and how will they spread out the cost? Without that knowledge, you're asking a lot of people to blindly go where, except for a couple of villages in our state, no one else is going. And we need to be aware of the need for people to have some idea of how it is going to operate after. And that's the one thing I think I've seen watching Lakewood, and I think it's been the biggest hindrance under the new law, is not having the requirement of some general plan. Jeff? I think just as interesting as the the precursor uh, in Johnson City is actually kind of the, the postscript. Uh, there, there certainly was certainly was a, a very long uh, three two years, quite frankly, as Mark had, had said. One interesting note was that uh, part of I suspect some of the legislation that, that the Attorney General Cole promulgated for better or for worse, and I have to apologize uh, for this in advance, um, may have arisen out of the, the early uh, dissolution process in Johnson City. Uh, Mark talked a little bit about the very compressed time frame that the statute now, now contains. The, the earlier statute had a reasonable standard. Um, there was probably a, a good six or nine month period there where the village actually was contesting the validity of the petition in, in Supreme Court based upon certain irregularities with the affirmations, the affidavits, and those types of things. So um, when Mark was talking about there was going to be a, a, a de-emphasis on the, on the actual the dotting the I's and crossing the T's relative to the petition that was submitted, some of that, I, I think, quite frankly, came out of the fact that those were litigated areas in the Village of Johnson City petition that went up into uh, our, our local Supreme Court. Once that finally came down with the court deciding that the petition was in fact valid and should move forward, um, they did appoint a commission, uh, a study commission, and that commission uh, spent quite a bit of time, well over, uh, well over a year, uh, doing its due diligence with the assistance. It was about a 15-member panel of village and town residents, and with the assistance of the Center for Government Research, put out um, a very lengthy report and plan. This actually is, is missing a few pages uh, of some addendums and some exhibits, 
but it, it, it didn't get any clearer than, than this from a transition perspective. Um, I guess an argument could be made that, that maybe there was too much information here uh, because during the public hearings, there were folks out there who unfortunately hadn't looked at this or even the executive summary um, and, and had questions at the public hearings, which were quite frankly very, very cleanly and clearly laid out in the, in the plan and even the executive summary. Um, so I certainly agree that under the new statute, the lack of information and the lack of a plan is, is not a good thing at all. But on the flip side, I certainly think there are going to be those who are, are not going to be looking at the information even if a plan was, was offered. Um, just as interesting, though, to me is what's occurred since the, the vote. As Mark indicated, it was a, essentially a split vote. And since that time, the village has undertaken uh, a number of, of steps to, uh, to effectually reduce share services, to reduce the, the, tax, the taxes that the, uh, the residents pay. The existing village board essentially is saying we can't ignore the, the half of you who essentially voted for dissolution. Um, so as a result, they have entered into shared services agreements for their fire chief and their police chief. They no longer employ a fire or police chief, but they contract for their services. Uh, with the fire chief, they're contracting with the neighboring village of Endicott, and with the police chief, it's with the neighboring city of Binghamton, both uh, resulting in some savings to uh, each municipality. Um, in addition, they've actually not hired or backfilled where they've had retirements. And in fact, in, in the case of the fire department, uh, affirmatively uh, laid off or abolished six positions. That action is actually working its way through the courts right now. And we may find ourselves arbitrating over whether that was permissible or not. Um, so, so the village, I think, hasn't ignored the dissolution vote. Um, they've taken certainly some steps to implement the alternatives recommended in this dissolution plan, areas where they can further share and, and find uh, savings. In addition to that, they've recently just reappointed a shared services committee consisting of five folks from the former dissolution committee. And they are looking at areas such as uh, the town, uh, town and village court consolidation, park and recreation consolidation, uh, refuse consolidation, and clerk treasurer office functions. Um, in addition, they're looking at planning and code enforcement uh, consolidation efforts. So they've kind of taken the alternatives that were set out in the dissolution report plan and are still rolling forward with those, again, in an effort to uh, attempt to share services and, and reduce their, their costs. Um, there, in fact, is, if all goes well, a plan that will consolidate the zoning and planning codes across the town the, and the two villages, um, which should occur early next year, together with consolidation of the zoning and planning functions uh, across those three municipalities as well. So, uh, you know, some might say dissolution failed and as much as the vote went down, but quite frankly, the village has is, is, is received the message and is taking steps to implement as much as they can to reduce those costs. I think quite frankly because they realize that if they if they were to treat the situation as status quo, they'd be having double and triple digit tax increases and they'd also quite frankly be looking at another dissolution petition when the, when the, uh, uh, when the bar uh, uh, period expired. John, you bring to us a, a more positive experience, at least, from the uh, dissolution process. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, for approximately 32 years, I served as a village attorney for the village of Randolph from 1976 to 2008 when I retired from that position. Um, the village of Randolph, as you may know, along with the village of East Randolph, uh, by a vote on March 16, 2010, voted to uh, dissolve and the dissolution will take effect pursuant to the then existing uh, village law, section 19, um, will take effect on December 31st, 2011. And the two villages of Randolph and East Randolph will now just become part of the town of Randolph. Um, our particular model, if I may use that term, I think it's probably different than anything we've talked about so far today. Um, as I perceive it, what happened here uh, resulting in this vote was, was a logical conclusion 
to years of work working towards this, this goal. Um, when I first uh, became village attorney in the 70s, right about that time, the position of, of village clerk, town clerk, treasurer became one. The same party uh, held that position. Uh, uh, Charlie Chris held that for many, many years. Um, in 2000, I believe three or four, the clerk treasurer position of, of East Randolph also became the same person as the clerk in Randolph and the town of Randolph. Um, when I first took the position of village attorney in the late 70s, we had a village police force consisting of approximately one full-time officer, one part-time. Um, we abolished that police force at that time, and we also simultaneously, right around that time, abolished the village justice position. From the late 70s, early 80s forward, it's the Cattaraugus County Sheriff's Department that has serviced the, uh, the town and village of Randolph area. From that point forward, especially picking up in the 80s and the 90s, uh, intermunicipal agreements were, uh, were frequently entered into where we had sharing of services, sharing of equipment, not only with the village of Randolph and at the time the town of Randolph, who Cameron Brooks was the town attorney until about 2002 or three, um, but also with the villages of Randolph and East Randolph and the town also. Uh, we got to the point where we were sharing our, uh, our equipment, our work crews. We even got to the point where the town highway superintendent assumed overall responsibility for our, our, our work crews. Additionally, in the early 2000s, um, after a lot of work, we uh, uh, built a uh, municipal building, which all three of the governmental entities shared, the village of Randolph, the village of East Randolph, and the town of Randolph. We, had, we were using one facility. Um, the older facility that the village had was in a state of disrepair. Um, looking down the road, this seemed to be a logical conclusion. <clears throat> I would say that as early as maybe 2000, some of the uh, folks on the village boards, in the town board, uh, the mayor, the board of trustees, started to think about consolidation, um, would go to meetings, uh, would get, gather information. Uh, my understanding is they received considerable help from the uh, um, town association and the conference of mayors. Even though there might have been a conflict for the conference of mayors, still they got considerable help from them. They never went to outside sources. They kept everything local. Um, they worked themselves to the point where uh, it, it was a logical conclusion around 2007, 2008 to, uh, <coughs> to form a, a, a committee to uh, study dissolution. And by the way, uh, in a couple of additional steps at that point, uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, a combined Randolph, East Randolph, water and septic uh, commission and system was set up, um, the two villages working together. Uh, and in 2005, the two local fire companies um, agreed to go to a uh, fire district. The next logical step simply was putting this vote up. And a uh, committee was established, uh, public hearings were held. Uh, at this particular point in time, I'm no longer a village attorney. A young lady from Randolph, Bridget Marshall, uh, she assumed the uh, final responsibilities for, for uh, helping to bring the matter to conclusion. Uh, as I say, a vote and a plan was proposed. Uh, it was adopted in March 16, 2010, and as I say, it will take effect in 2011. Unlike a lot of scenarios that you may have heard or, or, or even the Johnson City one like that, everybody was pretty much on board. There was not a lot of animosity between, uh, between the, uh, the boards and the community. Um, the vote was pretty much overwhelming. I think only, only 10 people voted against the uh, proposal. And the, the thinking seemed to be for such a small community, um, village of Randolph, about 1,300 people, the entire town, about 3,200 people, that this was a logical step to try to uh, look forward to uh, 
uh, staying as an entity in, in, in the future. Uh, we never lost our names. We're still going to be the Hamlet of Randolph or the Hamlet of East Randolph. Randolph High School is still going to be Randolph High School. Um, unlike other towns like maybe Lakewood would no longer retain that name, um, that, that never became a problem. And uh, so I just share that with you, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. You can see why I'm so delighted with this panel. You know, we have such a diverse range of experiences and expertise, and, uh, and I thank all of you for participating. Let's look at a, a made-up village, um, the village of St. Johnwood. That, of course, is my feeble attempt to combine three villages that have had some notoriety in this, uh, Seneca Falls, Johnson City, and Lakewood, into St. Johnwood, uh, a village of about 9,000 residents, uh, surrounded by a town that's not quite so sure that dissolution is what they have in mind. Um, and you'll find your packet, the facts in there. I, I ask the panel members, if you need to make up facts that aren't in the scenario, feel free. That's, that's part of the benefit of you being on the panel. You can make up whatever facts you want to fit your, your scenario. I want to start out with actually the last bullet item, um, which talks about the village attorney and the town attorney uh, being part of the same firm, because I know this will be of some interest to our attorney friends who are here today. And, you know, that's not unusual in, in rural areas, um, or even in, in more um, urban areas. You know, Jeff is the, the attorney for the village of Johnson City. I'm the attorney for the uh, school district. We're, we're in the same law firm. Uh, that can certainly, on some occasions, create issues that we have to talk about and decide how to resolve it. But I'm going to ask the panel member first, um, is it an impossible conflict from the get-go that we have the village attorney and the town attorney uh, from the same firm when the village is on the cusp, perhaps, of a municipal dissolution? What are your thoughts? I, I have to say I've struggled with this. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready to jump to the conclusion that it is a conflict. Uh, and I say that from the perspective of uh, the smaller the community, um, maybe uh, what might be a conflict in a larger community is not necessarily so. However, based upon the scenario that you've laid out here in this, this uh, hypothetical, where there looks like there's uh, some uh, animosity brewing between different groups, I think from the uh, attorney's uh, position, the argument that uh, you might want to avoid the appearance of impropriety, I'd be concerned that I could see that coming down the road. That's my thought. Jeff, how would that have worked out in, in Johnson City if, uh, if you had been the village attorney and I had been the town attorney? I think it would have been, I think it would have been problematic. And, and the one concrete example I can I can come up with as I've been pondering this was, uh, while not required under the old statute, we were able to enter into a um, memorandum of understanding between the village and the town as it related to how these services were going to be provided. Um, and quite frankly, this was something that you didn't even have to do until after you knew whether the dissolution was going to be going forward. In an effort to bring clarity to the situation and to provide that much more specificity for the, the residents of both the village and the town, we actually did end up entering into and executing a series of five MOUs with the, with the town of Union. Um, so, you know, in that case, I, I think it certainly does become problematic. I think you've got to look at it more than just an on the idea that it's, uh, it's consolidation. There's, there's always going to be those good things. I think the, um, the number of agreements, the shared service agreements, the potential for litigation between communities always raises the, the idea that at any moment the governing bodies could be at odds. So I think it's, it's something that firms have to look at, not just because there's the talk of consolidation or merger, but on a general day-to-day -day basis. What's going to happen tomorrow that might put the two communities at odds and have the need for um, somebody to step aside? I, I had to leave the village board back in the 80s because the village was suing the county, and I was a deputy county attorney at the time, uh, over a bridge construction and some flooding. Uh, there's always the potential for governments to be at odds, and I think every time you've got partners, you've got that risk, and especially the larger the community, because the potential for the conflicts involving um, police services and fire services and uh, jurisdictional lines becomes even, even more of a concern. 
That Mike, that is absolutely true. It, it, it probably is not any greater a risk. I think there are just some different nuances. Um, we we actually had uh, some dialogue with our village client regarding with Johnson City regarding the, this this very issue. Um, Beth Westfall, who um, had represented the village of Johnson City, had represented the village of Johnson City. Uh, with uh, with uh, with our firm as well for for many years, both she and I were working on this together, with uh, with with her primarily assisting the dissolution group, and, and me primarily assisting the village board. Uh, and at one point, there was a question raised as to whether that in of, in and of itself was even appropriate uh, from from the village board's perspective. Um, so again, not not a true conflict, but but certainly you know issues that you've got to think about and, and be ready to, to talk about quite frankly with your you know with your clients. I know as attorneys, we're always trying to look for the bright guidance in the ethical areas, and, and often it's more gray than, than bright. You know, John suggests that well, it may depend. You know, if if it's a small community and things are going well, there's general agreement, maybe it's workable. Um, Comments from the panel. I mean, does it depend, perhaps, on the scenarios that we're faced with? I don't think it can really be based on the scenarios. It's either right or it's wrong, and you've got to look at it. Um, whether there's going to be con there's enough concern in the community that even attorneys from different firms, when they're getting together and having discussions about government things, that there's something those attorneys are going to get, even coming from different different offices. Uh, there's a, a perception that public has. So that when two attorneys get together. So when you put two attorneys together from the same firm representing the different governing bodies, um, it, it does raise, raise some issues. And I, and I think you really got to look at the ability to continue doing it. Now, um, it may mean some people have to consider they've got to get out of representation of certain municipalities. But as the, the outline points out, I know there were some blanks about how many actual municipalities. There's a lot of municipalities who go around. Start looking for others to represent it if that's the work you're doing. But it, it is going to be, uh, be creating conflicts. It's going to get worse as different bodies and different government bodies start looking at, at these changes because, unfortunately, no matter what we do in consolidation, regionalizing, whatever, it still comes back to watch the money. And, and unfortunately, when there's money involved, there are going to be serious battles between the, the different factions, whether it's a, a group from in the town that doesn't really want to see the village. Responsibilities fall upon them. Uh, and that's the, the bigger thing. You, you see towns that are people have been elected to do a job, and they know what their responsibilities are. They haven't had to worry about fire, police, street lighting, and all of a sudden they're going to have to assume those duties. They may not be really excited about it. And having two attorneys from the same firm, I think it's just going to raise an appearance that will be very upsetting to the community. How about thoughts from the audience or questions that you have on this particular issue? Yes, sir. My question, and I don't know if any of you can answer it or not, I'm the mayor of the village of Westfield. We get preferential power from um, we are power authority. Our rate is 0 0.037 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, if we merge, uh, or dissolve the village of Westfield, we have, the village has the contract with New York State Power Authority Will that contract then go to the town? So far, nobody's been able to answer that question for me. Even the, the commissioner of New York State Power Authority has not been able to answer that question. That's one of the reasons I am here, to see if any of you people have had that experience and could answer that question for me. Well, as counsel for the panel, I'd suggest you don't be definitive in your answer. If the, if the commissioner doesn't know the answer, how would you feel about the same? I can I can tell you that just moments ago I was talking about the series of intermunicipal agreements and MOUs that the, the village uh, of Johnson City and the, the town of Union were, were negotiating. One of those one of those MOUs actually had to do with contracts that the village had entered into, um, and and would the town of Union on, and on what on, on, on what conditions would the town of Union assume those responsibilities? So one of the things that we did was we pulled all of the contracts that the Johnson City had entered into a stack about yay high, and we had those out there, and the town council for the, the town of Union came over and reviewed those contracts and, and the assignability of those contracts. 
given the nuances of the, of the power law and, and those issues, it, it, it's hard to say. That's okay. what everyone is to your specific situation. Right. Well, other question. Which, what kind of a procedure would we have to go through for the village to uh, take over the town, assimilate the town? Annex. Annex the town. Because we can retain our contract with the power authority because we already provide power in the village and the town. Well, there are provisions under, under the village law for a coterminous town and village. So that certainly is something that you could that could be looked at. Other questions from the audience, perhaps specifically on the attorney conflict issue. Any of the attorneys have a question about how we handle this? Let me ask the panel members this. Has the game changed under the new statute where let's say you've got the electorate who's petitioned for the dissolution and you don't have even a semblance of a plan. So we're in essence having a vote only on are we going to dissolve or not dissolve and we're not into discussions yet about what we're doing with collective bargaining agreements or how we're handling certain, certain issues. Is it too soon for the village attorney to back out because maybe the village isn't going to dissolve and, and in essence, someone may have lost their job prematurely. Does it matter that we don't have a plan to debate over yet? Or is it still the same issue? Mike, you're, you've got a furrowed brow, and I think you're, you're going to say, you're, we still got the same inherent conflict. Yeah, you know, it's whether there's a plan in place and whether, I mean, you're just changing the conflict now. Is somebody in a role similar to any elected official going to have a feeling of fighting this because I'm going to be out of work? I'm going to lose that uh, that government that I've been representing for how many however many years. Um, there is, and, I, and, and I'll tell you, I have. Uh, I don't think Sam's here, but Sam and I have these debates every so often in the village of Fredonia. Sam Grail, uh, he's been in the village attorney for a long time, and uh, he knows that when I got elected, I got an idea of uh, potentially being the last mayor of the village of Fredonia. And there are times when I see a resistance, not only as as an attorney but as a, a long-time employee of the village uh, with, with some resistance to it. And sometimes these decisions that are going to be made, there will be legal questions, but for the most part, they're not going to be the attorney's decision. And there is going to, even if you're not stepping out and getting somebody else involved in the process, the need to step back as attorneys and understand these, you may need to answer a legal question, but these, the, the issue of going forward is a political issue, is a, is a governmental issue. It's not a legal issue. There will be legal questions. Be ready to answer them, but you've got to find that fine line and not cross it because it's it is not going to be a legal decision. Can we do this? The law does allow it. It's now how do we how do we get there? So I, I think again you have to be cautious. Be ready to step aside for a number of reasons, including the loss of, of employment, but also the loss of uh, I've worked so hard to make sure this thing runs the way it does and help out with that. I would agree. I would agree with Mike that I guess to the extent that in, in large measure, when you're dealing with the, the dissolution piece of it, you are giving guidance on how the process works. So from that perspective, um, I, I could certainly see perhaps hanging in there, you know, for a little while longer uh, in the scenario you presented in terms of um, we're voting yes or no, and I as counsel am giving advice to my client relative to that process. When does the when does the vote have to be, you know, sent over to the county board of elections? And what form will it take? What are the timelines? Certainly, working through those issues, I don't see a, a conflict arising with the town as of yet. Although that certainly doesn't take off the table the, the potential for a, a perception issue uh, in the eyes of the public. And John, it sounds like in, in your area, much much of the hard work had already been done. This was really just kind of the, the final step in a long process of That's thought. That's correct. And as a matter of fact. Um, after Cameron stepped down as town attorney, I served not only as village attorney, but I served as town attorney for a few years, two or three years. Um, I made it perfectly clear to everybody that if there were ever a, a conflict, I would have to remove myself. Uh, knock on wood, no potential conflicts arose at that particular point in time. Um, one of the arguments against going through this procedure, the dissolution procedure, is the cost involved. And if you've got a very rural, small community like ours is, and suddenly you have uh, your village attorney, your town attorney stepping away from the plate uh, and for the most part getting a, uh, a probably a very reasonable 
fee for, for their services, and you start bringing in outside counsel to uh, helping you on a project like this, uh, your costs are going to, your legal professional costs are going to escalate. And that in and of itself may become an argument uh, as to why not to go forward. <laughs> That's a really interesting point. Many times in our towns and our villages, the one cohesive person who's been there for 30 years, after many boards have come and gone, is the village of the town attorney. I mean, typically they know the history or the indebtedness and how the sewer districts were formed. And, and John, you're right. You know, you do certainly lose some of that historical knowledge that maybe the attorney brings to the table. Mike? Well, the other aspect, too, is the scenario that's laid out here, it's, there seems to be some split on the board itself. And for a long time, if you've been doing this 30 years or, or whatever, you've gotten into a routine. You know that you're going to be giving advice to both the mayor and the board and maybe all, you know, multiple board members. Um, I, I think the potential just within, within that governing body of the conflict of whose advice, if you're giving advice on the issue uh, and, it's, and you're not stepping back and just saying procedurally, here's what you need to do, um, but you've got the potential of having multiple opinions on that board that you're trying to advise as well as a mayor who has a different perspective. And to, to be the attorney for, for all of those in this solution process is going to be much more difficult than it is on a day-to-day -day basis when there are those conflicts or disagreements. Let's talk about the board meetings themselves and switch gears a little bit. You know, in between the plaster falling down uh, on, the, on the village board members in the audience, uh, we've got a very active and, and growing taxpayer advocacy group in this village. They go to every single meeting, and typically, uh, they like to dominate the public portion of the discussion, sometimes speaking 45 minutes on topic they talked about at the last meeting and the meeting before that. Uh, Pat Lawrence, how much do we have to tolerate as far as a, a vocal uh, public uh, group monopolizing the business part uh, of a board meeting? Thoughts? Quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Again, John, Johnson City, um, <laughs> shortly after the dissolution vote, attempted to implement certain procedural uh, limitations in terms of the, the length of time you could speak and, and those types of things, and it, it did not go over well. Um, did not, did not, uh, did ultimately did not get passed. Um, they had two privileges of the floor, and uh, there was a proposal to remove it to one, and, and suffice it to say, they still have two. Um, so they, they, they endure they endure quite a bit in Johnson City. I would think that in today's environment, um, just politically to try to restrict that to a minimal period of time, it, it, that's not going to work. Um, I, I would agree that uh, if you've got to give some leeway to the public. Uh, for many years, we complained nobody would ever show up at the public meeting. Unless you're talking about taxes, garbage, or dogs. And uh, that was it. Um, Not necessarily that. So I think it's probably good to encourage more participation. Uh, certainly the Supreme Court does, and if they can do it, I think that as village officials, we could probably do it too. But am I right legally that we're not required to open up any part of the board meeting to the public? That's my understanding. We don't have to provide for public participation. And yet, what's the, what's the follow-up from that approach is the concern. Mike, how would that work in the village if you told people, sit down, this is a village board business meeting and we don't want to hear from you? Well, we, we have two, two meetings. We have a, a workshop, and at that point, there, there is no public participation. We then have our regular uh, meeting where resolutions are going to be passed, and we do provide for a public portion there. We have general rules out there of three to five minutes. In four years, I've never asked anybody to sit down. I think if you take on an elected position and you're going to be ready to take on this kind of a uh, issue, you need to be ready that the three and five minutes aren't going to hold up and you're going to have to hear a lot of it and you're going to hear the same arguments. And you have to hope that the people that are listening to those arguments are getting just as bored with hearing them over and over again as you are and that it's not necessarily influencing anybody. But to try to, to quiet it down or to calm it down by limiting and not having a public portion of that, uh, I think you're, you're asking for trouble. Um, 
you know, some, some governing bodies will, will say that the first, maybe create a second public portion if you got into it and there were enough people. Because you could do then is have your, your first, first portion for anything that's actually on our agenda. Yeah. Because most of the time, the, the dissolution and the consolidation are not going to be on the agendas. Uh, let people talk about the resolutions you have to pass as part of your business meeting, and then open it up at the end for a public portion. And then if, if the legislators or the, the governing body wants to sit and listen, they can certainly sit and listen. And if they don't, they're not going to be forced to, to stay for that part of the meeting and could leave. But at least the business gets done, and you have held your comments to actual votes being taken that evening, as opposed to the free for all. And then again, nobody has to feel obligated to stay because the business portion is done, and people can then they want to talk to a microphone or the local um, cable television for uh, an hour, let them go. How about in the audience? How many town or village board members do we have that are, are here today? We've got some. Has this been a problem in, in your municipalities, and have you taken effective measures or <laughs> ineffective measures to try to deal with that? Maybe you want to share your experience? I'm an attorney and also a village trustee in the village of Cuba. Uh, we just went through this uh, entire process that's being discussed today, and it was over. It was overwhelming. The uh, uh, voting populace did not want to dissolve the village. What was interesting is that at the village board meetings there was some participation. Opponents for it just didn't show up, so it wasn't. Uh, it was not an issue. Interesting. So in, the, in that in that village, was it primarily a, a public relations campaign outside of the, the governmental process, or it was initiated and then just not Well, pushed? it was initiated by um, village residents. I don't actually understand how they got the 10% uh, votes to get the petition in, because in the final vote, they had fewer votes than agreed on the initial petition. Um, so there were some questions as to what people were being told that this entire process was actually about. Um, but once information started uh, being disseminated, individuals or opponents for the solution simply stopped uh, participating. And in your village, was that the pre-March statute where you had the dissolution plan presented it out in the public, or was it the post where there was no plan to even know what This was the post. Post, okay, interesting. Any, anybody else share your experiences? All right, let's take a look at the, the what I call the very popular police department. Ten members, they're your friends, they're your neighbors. Um, they've all been experienced. We've got some training issues uh, that's resulted in a pretty hefty uh, 1983 action against uh, against the village, and more problematic perhaps, an old collective bargaining agreement uh, that contains a clause that we can't reduce the village uh, police department by more than 10 members. In a dissolution process, one of two things is likely to happen perhaps. Uh, the county might take over those functions and those 10 members may or may not have jobs, um, or perhaps some of them will have jobs, is the, is the existence of this CBA with that standstill clause problematic going forward, or does it simply go away uh, when the county sheriff's department takes over? How, how does this effectively work? Jeff? Well, that was, that was an issue that, that the, the Village of Johnson City's position was they, they just go away. Uh, but, but quite honestly, um, we were anticipating that would be challenged. Um, by the unions. In worst case scenario, you, you might have some impact bargaining that you have to do uh, on the one hand, but the, the other worst case scenario was that the, the courts would, would say, no, those, those contracts, you know, go, go right on over to, uh, to the new, new employer. Uh, we, were, we were hopeful that, that uh, you know, they would go away and there would be no challenge, but we were, quite frankly, if the village uh, had wanted to dissolve, we were anticipating for some, some lengthy court battles as well as potential uh, uh, arbitrations. I did not have that problem to deal with because, as I mentioned, we had abolished our uh, village police department in the 70s. Um, when the town, when, when the most recent vote was approved, part of the plan is that the, the town will take over the uh, 
the positions of the school employees. No one's going to lose their job. It's going to be preserved. But we didn't have to deal with the police. Uh, I recognize that this police issue has got all sorts of Taylor law implications. Um, but then there are some curb rulings, I think, saying you can abolish these departments. And, uh, but that will probably have a court challenge, I would think. The, the only way, I think, to make these successful hoping that the courts will go along as, as these things come up, is to have those collective bargaining agreements go with the village that's dissolved. If they have to transfer, uh, there's not the opportunity to start, start from scratch and to have the new government decide how many employees it wants, particularly if you have a, a, a collective bargaining agreement that sets minimum staffing. The only way to get to the root of the problem is to have those go away, allow the new government, whether it's a local sheriff or if it's the town, take over and sit down. Um, and they're going to have to negotiate. Somebody's going to organize the employees. Uh, but at least you're starting on a, a new, new course. If you simply take the existing agreements, uh, we're not going to see the savings that regionalizing or consolidation is going to allow for. And that is going to be, no question, the, the biggest problem. We attempted to consolidate our justice courts in the village of Fredonia and the town of Pomfret. The town and the village both have the same two judges. Um, they use village hall for both courts. I challenge anybody to, to know exactly which court they're actually in front of when they go in there with a ticket. Um, the difference being, we have uh, two clerks in the village and at that time one and a half clerks in the town. Uh, there was pretty much agreement that the court as a consolidated group could run with three by the town we would have had considerable savings. Everybody knew that the union was going to fight this, and in fact, they fought it adamantly because it would have been two village positions lost. Uh, and the clearest image of why they fought as hard as they did and the, the emphasis they, they worked in an election campaign on, on a couple of trustees, when we got into some discussion this past year and the town was going to hire a, uh, or move a clerk into a full-time, uh, we found that the village clerk doing the same work as the town clerk in a court with similar duties, town and village. The village employee was $19 an hour, the town employee was $13.50 an hour. Um, obviously, when point one and point eights are your highest portion of your budgets, and you have stripped everything you can possibly get out of your equipment and your contracts and your supplies and your, your salt, it comes down to employees. And the bargaining units are going to have an even larger vested interest than a 35-year trustee who really doesn't want to lose his title. Um, this is bread and butter for, for people. Uh, and that's where, if, if we aren't successful in seeing um, the challenge to the loss of six firefighters in Johnson City being successful going through the courts, I think we're spinning our wheels. I mean, we need to see that the courts take the approach that governing bodies or the electorate can make these decisions and not prevent it from organizing, but you may have to start from scratch. Question. Chuck D'Angelo's not out there, is he? Because I'm not. I'm calling. Doesn't it say in the, in the law that the town has no obligation of hiring any of the village employees? If, you're, if your village is dissolved, that means there's no village, there's no employees. Correct. Then why do you get into this discussion with unions? They're not employed any place anymore. No, and, the, and the, the discussion with the union will come once the town has assumed that its obligation to provide some level of service. They're going to say, we, we now have a village that's dissolved. We used to have 16 police officers or, or 14 police officers, and it's a 10 in this scenario. We had 10 before. Uh, we're going to need to continue to provide police protection. We're going to give it a shot with aid. But the minute that aid is higher, whoever it is, whether you're bringing on some of the uh, former village employees, or you go out and hire a whole new group coming out of the academy, it won't be long before they'll have somebody in organizing them and getting their, their collective bargaining rights going. And so you have to expect that to happen. Right. The, the, the hope is to be able to get a new, a new bottom line to start with. Unfortunately, when we go into these now, I don't think there's anybody that's coming out without at least a 3% increase along with the steps, so that you know, you're looking at 6% increase almost everywhere. It seems to be the bottom line everybody will get to at some point. And with police and fire, 
if you have those employees, you're no longer really left to negotiate because at any point they can, when the impasse is declared, it goes to binding arbitration. Uh, so I think you need to get a new square one. I don't think you're going to see great savings because those first contracts are then going to be compared to what other contracts are in the surrounding area. Um, but it does give you a chance to determine, again, how many people you need, particularly if you have a minimum staffing. And it will give you the opportunity to at least start with new numbers and, and a new starting point and uh, relying upon all of the successes of governments, governments around the area that have finally gotten contributions to health insurance and be able to use that in your new contract. There's no doubt when we start talking about fire and safety um, and police protection, that cuts the essence of a lot of these discussions because it gets to the what we call the fear of the unknown. You know, a village resident who's been served by the fire station two blocks away and expects a response time, real or imagined, of five minutes, is not going to be so sure that the neighboring village or a, uh, a fire protection volunteer provider can provide that same level of response. <coughs> and uh, and that, that has been an ongoing concern in a number of our dissolution votes. You know, let's, let's talk about the, the one item that, that Mike brought up. I'm going to switch the, this scenario a bit, where we had the village court clerk making $19 an hour and the town court clerk making $13 an hour. And now, because of a dissolution, we're going to have the town court clerk with the responsibilities of all the town functions he or she had, plus now the village functions, and yet earning $6 less than his or her um, you know, colleague was uh, just a month before. How do we deal with those nuts and bolts personnel issues where somebody's taking on more duties but getting paid less than what their colleague was in the now dissolved village. Is it too rare to worry about or because it seems to me if we simply then start raising the budgetary line appropriations for everybody to be equal to what they were, we haven't really realized the savings that we were hoping to get under the, the now combined uh, services. Fair concern? Yeah, very fair concern. And, 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 and I think listening to, to what Mike was saying as well as what was in the Johnson City experience, the, the, the savings really does come from what you hope are increased efficiencies and doing more with less. Um, if you are raising the, the, the rates to the highest you know, uh, ceiling area, that's certainly going to hurt. Uh, but I'd say a majority of the savings in the Village of Johnson City plan, as you pointed out, Mark, in your, in your introduction, was the, the net loss of, of approximately 40 employees um, so in the theory, the, the, the dissolved village functions were going to be performed by approximately 40 fewer employees. And that is, quite frankly, where the majority of the savings come from. So th those are going to be, you know, realistic issues. Folks, you know, will be doing, you know, either more or less or, or more more efficiently. John, you had a pretty successful well, transition. Perhaps to assist that, though, yeah. is that grant money you talked about? Are we talking a million dollars for Johnson City? My understanding is Randolph, and I may not be totally on point here. I suggest for you municipal folks, you give the village clerk a call down there to confirm. But I think they're looking at an extra $184,000 a year uh, from the state in, in grant money on an annual basis, which would be in addition to whatever other monies they also receive at this point. But uh, that can go somewhat to maybe offset some of those. How long is that for now? As this, uh, as the mayor of Westfield notes, so where's that money coming from, right? It's right. it's coming from New York, so ultimately it's uh, yeah, it's somewhere or other all there. We're all paying for it. And John, how long is that payment? Yeah. How many years is that good for? My, my, Forever? No, my, my recollection is that it is a relatively short time frame five years maybe, and then it, and then it might start decreasing or, or entirely go away, but but that was a couple of years ago, and that wasn't on, under our current situation. Do you, Mike, do you have any no idea how long they go for? But in this day and age, uh, uh, if it's coming from the state, I would say it's uh, I wouldn't month to month. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Um, you're, you're now hitting really the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. And, and in Western New York, where I don't know, but, you know, over half of employment is related to either government education, 
non-government NGOs, that kind of thing. How, how do you convince, this is where the rubber meets the road, how do you convince people their employment prospects are going to be gooder, with better, if you reduce the ten general tax level, which is supposed to spur private activity? Uh, I happen to be the town attorney that the mayor was talking about when we had the village in our town. The, the, the problem doesn't go away either, because now we have a personnel issue by the town board, which we didn't have before, uh, talking about the disparity in the rates. And, and it raises another point that the mayor talked about, and, and, and inadvertently, in, in a roundabout way, it points out the different expectations that those of us in town government, I've been a town attorney for 30 years for about five different towns, never village, never city. In towns, there's a certain expectation uh, and a, a, of people in town government with respect to services, employment, salaries, and so on. That those expectations are not replicated necessarily in villages or small cities, of which we have one in the north end of the county that really should be a village. But that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> Well, let me throw something else on the table. If I'm a town highway worker and I'm not currently represented by a union, I've got no CBA covering me, but I see that my town might be taking on the burden of now work within a village, additional snow plowing responsibilities, hatching in the summer, I mean, you name it. Am I talking to my local Teamsters rep about maybe it's time that we get our highway guys organized to protect ourselves? I haven't seen that, but is it a likely scenario, Mike? I think the thing you find with the town is because it has generally got a smaller employment base, there is much more camaraderie. There is, uh, the town conference takes out its DPW once a year for a dinner. Uh, they've never had these issues. I don't think they've actually picked up the copy of the village contract on a regular basis to see how much more uh, a village employee is making because it's larger, it's less personal. Um, you've got you know, the negotiated contract. Everybody lives by it. You get your grievances throughout the day, throughout the year. Uh, you don't see that at the town. Uh, that is probably one change that will take place with the town. If the village is dissolved, all of a sudden you now have a set of eight employees in the DPW. You're going to be up to maybe 14 or 16 to take on the extra work. Now you have the reason why they're going to be contacting. Now they're going to be organizing. And chances are you're going to have one or two coming over um, from the prior door, from the village employee who will take on a job. And they're going to bring with them some of the idea that it's not good enough. You may be having your dinner once a year with the town board and everybody has a little get together. But we're making, uh, you're making after a lifetime what I was making in 10 years, uh, you know, 25 year employee making the same as a 10 year employee in the village it's time for you to get better paid. Um, I think that will come, and you will, again, you will ultimately will see the, the contracts negotiated and get more in, increased salary at the town level. But again, it's going to come with the expectation you can do it with fewer people, the, the efficiencies of covering a larger area uh, and, and using the excess capacity of both those governments, uh, you'll be able to have it with fewer people, and yes, you ultimately will be building up their pay. So I would think from the town workers, they might be looking at it as this is an opportunity if it happens um, to actually see our, our a better and more improvements in our, our benefits than we're getting right now as a small group in, in the township. Let's uh, jump to one more topic before. The other thing that enters into that is you're like the village of West you, know, you have your own water system, you have your own wastewater treatment plant. Most people all have to have state licenses. You, you can't just throw them away and start in all over again. In the electric department, those guys have all been there for years. You just can't fire them and start training new people all of a sudden. So there's a certain number of people that you have to keep, regardless of where you found in the village or whatever. Yeah, but, but again, it would be, if, if it's turned over, the assets then become the town's assets. Uh, they've got to rehire, uh, and they've got to you know, decide Certainly with the, um, the operator positions, they're going to need to keep, and probably be forced to keep the people, whether they want to or not, the employees that are there, because that area has become so competitive in trying to find people that actually have the license. They're hard to find. Yes. 
Can, can I just go back? I'm sorry. No, go ahead. What if the uh, young man up there, village attorney for Cuba? Yes. Um, I just want to make a comment. I always say Western New York's a small town. Um, I was at a not-for-profit board meeting in only a couple of days ago, and there were some Cuba residents there whose name I won't mention, but they were talking about your vote and the fact it went down. And from what I gathered from that conversation, they were mostly concerned about their village zoning code would now be abolished, and they had no idea whether or not the town would replicate that particular zoning code. And so I share that with you just for that purpose. I got a better Cuba story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Cordonia was the host of the Western, uh, the, the uh, Southwestern Firemen's Convention last year. Uh, Cuba was one of the fire departments that came into the village of Fredonia. If you're not familiar with firemen's conventions, they have garages they use around town for dugouts. Um, there was only one arrest during the entire convention <laughs> in Fredonia <laughs> that year, and it was Cuba. Uh, and even better for me is that they were using my garage for their dugouts. <laughs> Your connection with Cuba. <laughs> I had a question up here. Sir. I had a question with respect. You indicated that the tax savings that you showed in the plan was over four and a half million dollars. Did you factor in also the uh, cost of any special districts that would have to be created, uh, fire or whatever? Yes. Yes, I, I will say this. The, the, what were the comparable costs of those districts? Well, th that's the interesting point, is when you're talking about even a water or electric or, or sewer districts, I mean, the, the reality is that those, those costs are going to stay with the former village residents. So you're, you're not really going to find any savings in, in the existing special districts that, sh that you have. So, um, you know, that becomes a non-issue. The savings I was that we were talking about before relative to the police and the fire, those were a result of, of two primary drivers, the primary driver being the, the smaller number of resources that were going to be de deployed at what the <coughs> committee thought would provide a comparable, not equivalent, but a comparable level of service and the reduced uh, pay grade that in the one instance you found at the county sheriff's department um, and, and I believe a, a slightly reduced pay grade that you saw in the other village. Is that a paid fire department or volunteer? Uh, paid. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We've got about three minutes before lunch. I just want to have one other bullet item, and that is the outside state or federal regulatory agency that's not too happy already with some things going on in the village. Uh, we've got a, a old sewage treatment plant that's uh, spilling into the nearby river. We've got a water filtration system that's got a, uh, an inadequate spillway. We've got DEC oversight issues, EPA concerns. Uh, panel members, I'm assuming that these penalties or consent orders or what have you obligations aren't simply going to go away, right? No, they are not going to go away. Um, but as we kind of chatted just a second ago, I mean, they largely are going to stay, they're, they're largely going to be passed on to the, the user. The, uh, the, 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 the water district, the sewer district, they're going to bear the, the, the burden of, of, those, of those penalties. Um, and again, in, in, in this fact scenario, um, it's largely going to be the, village, the former village residents who are going to be bearing those, those costs. Uh, and who will likely be bearing the, the cost of the debt to make the necessary improvements. So, you know, that, that issue will not go away. John? Uh, that's my understanding when the Randolph plan was adopted, it specifically made reference to the fact that within our inner part of our village, we have a wastewater, a gray water uh, a system which re is required uh, for residents to hook up to. Uh, this came about after years and years of the county health department getting on basically the backs of the village folks. Um, the expenses related to that will stay with that portion of the community where that system exists. That will not necessarily become a taxable item for the rest of the town residents. Even if part of the town is hooked into it? No. Um, in our, our situation, the town is not hooked into it. Okay. Um, matter of fact, not the entire village is hooked into it. But it's, it's, it's only to the area that is okay. identified within that but I would think any, any area served would be part yes. of the cost. Right. And this is one probably one of the less glamorous parts of, of government, the water or the sewer. But it's one of those areas where we probably have suffered the most in having it typically a responsibility that the village, the smaller government, has maintained. 
Um, it's extremely difficult right now to expand districts. You have to have a district created to send water anywhere else, to pick up sewer anywhere else. And typically the village wants two to three times the rate to extend those services outside of the village limits because how dare you not have been next to us 20 years ago where we could have the tax revenue. So those, those built-in costs have probably kept a system that could have supplied and could have been used to a greater capacity, which would have generated the income that would have allowed for the improvements to be made. And we've lost those because we weren't able to quickly move. I, you know, when the village and the town, what, what do you have, about seven water districts right now until the town finally went and created yeah, the we, 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 we buy from Fredonia, we yeah. have at least four or five from Fredonia and one from the city of Dunkirk. You only wonder if, if the town had owned those operations 20 years ago and could have easily extended and sold water to a larger base or to have assumed more properties for the wastewater system if we wouldn't have been better financially in the cost that we're having for those today because we would have expanded if we had the capacity. Um, we've had a, our sewer plant, we've had a, excess capacity for a number of years, but we have no way of selling it without going through a district and then you get into all of the, of the battles. And, and those battles go back to boards long before myself. Uh, in Perdonia and Pompert, there was battles over annexation. You go down Route 60 today, uh, high water using businesses are on the village side, McDonald's, Tim Hortons, a car wash. On the other side of the street is Value and Patton Electric. Don't need a lot of water because on that side they were to pay three times the water rate. So it was cheaper to build a restaurant in Perdonia and pay for our water pay higher village taxes than it was to build on the other side of the street. And we've, we've, we've limited ourselves by that geography, by um, these old lines. And, and people don't necessarily want to talk about that because it's not real glamorous and it doesn't involve the employee contracts. But we've gotten ourselves into the bind where we need to move forward, we need to regionalize, we need to consolidate because we have capacity that we can share at a fair cost and be able to share that over the larger area and not have ourselves locked into these fine lines of geography which have kept us from progressing, have made us in Chautauqua County the fifth highest uh, ratio of property tax to real property value in the nation. Um, we've got to move forward and it's going to take people that are here uh, to do that and to overcome the barriers that municipal elected officials face in doing this. We're out of time. Panel members, John, Jeff, Mike, thanks so much. Thanks for your help and participation. Much more to come on this topic, uh, as I'm sure we all know. And I think we're doing some lunch downstairs. Lunch is ready uh, downstairs. Make sure you give Mary Parsons your sheet so you can get credit for your CLE credit today. Thanks.